Hi, Jimmy Hamilton. Uh, we're still uh, in Galatians, uh, in Galatians chapter 2, and our uh, subject, our theme is still uh, justification unto free grace. The grace of God that liberates, that justifies a man, a woman before God, makes them right, that is, by faith, and by faith alone apart from works. So we are dealing with this subject in Galatians chapter 2. If you would like to turn there with me, please. And we'll read from verse 1 to the end of the chapter. Galatians 2, I'm reading from verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seemed to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrariwise, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor the same, which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For though through the law I am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. 
and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Thus far we read in God's holy and infallible word. Our text uh, for today is found in verses 11 through 14, the public reproval. The Apostle Paul has to reprove the Apostle Peter. Uh, we were saying yesterday, uh, if you were with me, uh, how that, um, well, we can see from these men that um, they are apostles of God, servants of God and of Jesus Christ, but they are yet sinners. And if you need proof of that, well, this incident that we look at here today, well, here is the proof of the matter. They are yet sinful men. This is, of course, uh, dramatic because it takes place before the entirety of the church in Antioch. And so there's danger here. The unity of the church is endangered. The gospel is endangered. Oh, there are so many issues that come out of this. This is why Paul waxes so much about it. You know, his uh, credentials concerning his apostleship, uh, his message, the gospel. Uh, there are so many things that, that factored into this that come out of this. They are so important vital that he deals with them and vital that he publicly reproves his brother and fellow apostle Peter. So we've moved now from the uh, Paul has in his writing to the Galatian churches but remember that's who he's writing to in the first instance the churches in Galatia who are being infiltrated and being infected, infected by the Judaizers who are telling them that faith in Jesus Christ is not enough but they need also to be circumcised. They need to keep the law in its entirety. So in this incident uh, he has moved from the council in Jerusalem that we were speaking of yesterday and he has moved up north to Antioch, which was on the Mediterranean coast, directly north from Jerusalem. In today's terms, it would be in the territory of Turkey. <coughs> it uh, was more than suggested, I think, uh, by the Judaizers that there was duplicity with, uh, um, with Paul, you know. Um, they were saying perhaps, you know, that, well, he preaches uh, one gospel when he's up in Galatia amongst the Gentiles, but when he's down there in Judea, well, he's preaching another gospel. He's being duplicious, you know, dissimulation, hypocrisy. No duplicity with Paul. Verse 10 of chapter 1, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I think that we have, in the verses that we've covered thus far, I think that we have made it plainly clear that Paul was of a single mind. No duplicity at all. But we can't say that of our brother Peter. We can't say that of the Apostle Peter. Here we have his duplicity here in these verses of which we read. But the reason why Paul brings this to our minds, why he writes this to the Galatian churches, is a further defense of his apostleship. It's so important that they know and understand that it's a, an apostle of Jesus Christ who is writing to them, who is teaching them, who is preaching to them and that his, his gospel, his message, is an infallible one that is given to him directly by revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul is furthering his defense of his apostleship, his 
credentials. It's his last throw of the dice. It's his last um, proof, that is, of his office as an apostle. And showing and de demonstrating to the Galatian churches that he's not inferior to the other apostles. And here's the proof of the matter. He's not inferior to the apostle Peter. Yeah. It's uh, not that he's, um, you know, uh, concerned for his own self, his own reputation, you know, that um, he wants to be seen as part of the hierarchy and all that kind of thing. That's not in Paul's mind at all. He calls himself um, uh, the Corinth in Corinthians. Um, he says that, you know, Inwardly, he sees himself as being inferior to the other apostles, the least of the apostles, he says. I count myself to be no apostle at all. But of course, um, he has to make it clear for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the church, for the glory of Christ and for the salvation of men's souls. He has to, he has to make it clear that he is an apostle and he's not inferior to the other apostles either. So both these men, Peter and Paul, both of them are Christian men, Christian brothers. They have the same commission from Jesus Christ directly, the same calling to be apostles, and they have the same mission, working in different spheres, of service, Peter down in Judea, Paul up amongst the heathen, the Gentiles. But they both, they're on the same mission. And uh, Peter uh, taught exactly the same, that's been made clear, he taught exactly the same as what uh, the Apostle Paul did. That's not what's being questioned here. It's not his teaching, not what he preaches. That's not being questioned. It's his conduct. It's his conversation. It's his behavior that's being questioned here. Because it's a contradiction of what he says he believes and what he teaches, what he preaches. Dissimulation. Duplicity. And of course, uh, a contradiction of the gospel, more importantly. So his conduct, his behavior is shameful and it is harmful. Now, uh, maybe you could ask the question, you could say, well, what right has Paul got to rebuke Peter, an apostle and a leader in the church in Jerusalem? Well, that's the very point of what he's saying and what he's writing to the Galatians. Yes, he has the right. Yes, he has the authority. Yes, he has the power to reprove the Apostle Peter from the leader from the church in Jerusalem. Because Paul is an apostle himself, contrary to what the Judaizers are telling the Galatian churches. He is an apostle. Chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle. Directly commissioned and called by Jesus Christ himself. So he has the power. He has the authority. And here's the proof of it. Because he reproved Peter for his shameful, harmful duplicity the simulation. So, you see, it's the very issue here, of course, that was clarified in the council that we've just read about in the previous verses that took place in Jerusalem. It was all clarified. They were all of one mind. They don't, Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to keep the law. Faith in Christ, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone justifies a man or woman before God. Nothing else, no additions, none whatsoever. All of the same mind. It's that doctrine, that doctrine that the good man Luther 
at the time of the Reformation supposedly said that um, is the, um, the, do the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. Justification. Free justification. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Cannot say it, ever say it enough. So three things here. The duplicity, the diffusion, and the disapproval. The duplicity, verses 11 and 12. The diffusion, verse 13. And the disapproval, verse 14. The duplicity, first of all, verses 11 and 12. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. But for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Peter's duplicity. Yeah. Now, uh, before you would uh, get the down on Peter, if you've been round the block uh, more than once, as a Christian that is, if you've been on the pathway for... Um, long enough, you will perhaps have understood that there is still with you a weakness. We have been made as Christians, reborn, regenerated. We have been given uh, to be partakers of the divine nature. We have a new nature. But the problem is we've discovered from God's word and from our own experience We've discovered that, to our disappointment, that the old nature is still there too. We have that human nature, we have that human nature, and of course, well, if you've grasped that, if you've understood that, well, you will not be surprised at Peter's duplicity, and you will not be down on him too much. And then, of course, there's the problem of our faith, too, because our faith is not as consistent and as strong as we would like it to be or as we maybe even think it to be. Uh, in my ministry on the streets, there are some days where you'll find me perhaps um, reproving boldly some blaspheming bully, some big ugly monster of a man and then the next day perhaps if you were with me you would you would hear perhaps an old lady shout behind me and I'd just about jump out my skin <laughs> because my faith is not consistent it's not always strong sometimes it's weak sometimes it's stronger at times than others so you see there are inconsistencies with us all there's that weakness there's that old nature that's still there that wars against our new natures there is still that element of human weakness in us and we are and never will be free of it in this world not until we depart this world into the glory of heaven so we have fallen natures. So Paul gives, um, because of this, in 1 Corinthians and chapter 10, he gives us a very timely and a very good warning. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So as you read that, listen to this account perhaps of Peter's duplicity, his dissimulation, tainted with mercy because who knows maybe you will find yourself in this exact exact circumstance yourself one day so um the apostles you know um they were like they were men of, of flesh and blood just like ourselves same natures although they were mighty apostles mightily used of god but they were still sinners. They still had that same weakness of nature that you and I have. 
and Paul laments of it. 30 years on the Christian pathway and he writes to the Romans in chapter 7 verses 14 to the end of the chapter lamenting of that sinful nature yet within him that wars against his soul and he cries at the end who shall deliver me from this body of death and he answers thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ that's all so the good that we would, we do not always do. But Antioch, uh, where we've moved up to now, the church in Antioch was, um, was a, a very blessed church. If you turn to the Acts of the Apostles and to Acts chapter 11 and to verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which were, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. Antioch was um, was a work that was blessed indeed, and um, and of course it was um, it was made up of a, a mixture of both Jews and Gentiles. Uh, it was a sending church, and of course it was free. Um, well, to some degree, it was free of the. Um, Judaistic influence, you know, the church back down in Judea where Peter, James and John are working, I don't think they ever got free altogether of the Judaistic traditions. They were fighting that all the time. Whereas the church up in Antioch, although there was, you know, the Judaizers coming in and infiltrating and affecting and that, that uh, it, it, it wasn't quite so um, uh, it, it, it wasn't so deep deeply ingrained as it, as um, you know down in Judea. So the situation that we have here in verses 11 and 12 it is probably one of these uh, love feasts that they have and of course there's many people present. This is in public you see it's part of the problem. There's a lot of people. Christians, there are Jews, and there are Gentiles. There's a mix. Christians getting together. A love feast. Beautiful. Lovely thing to do. We should do more of it today. And Peter's quite comfortable at first. He's up on a, a, a trip. Why? We don't know. We're not told. But he's come up from Jerusalem, uh, and he's, um, he's gathering, he's assembling uh, with the Christians here at Antioch. And at first, of course, he's, uh, he's, quite, um, he's quite comfortable until that is um, uh, some people, uh, some uh, Jews. Now, now what, these, what these people are, uh, we can't rightly say, we don't know. But they've come from James, that is, they've come from Judea, they've come from the church down south, Jerusalem way, yeah? And maybe, I don't know, maybe perhaps they're sympathizers. Maybe they have some measure of sympathy with the Judaizers. Um, you know, uh, if they were members in the church in Judea, well, you would think because of Peter, James and John, and they agree with Paul, they're teaching the same thing, well, Surely that you would think their minds ought to be clear of this by now. Uh, you could ask the question maybe why why were they not dealt with? But see, you have to understand that the traditions, you know, these are we're talking about men, and we're talking about Peter too, but these these are men who have been brought up with these Judaistic traditions. And it dies hard. It dies, it dies hard, you know. And, and, and don't many people struggle 
with issues like this today, you get somebody who's converted out of the Roman Catholic Church, who's been brought up with all that stuff, all that superstition, it dies hard. Or maybe some other cult, you know, if they've been brought up with it, if that's all they've been taught, you know, from day one. You know, that they, they, they've imbibed it, that's ingrained in them. And and here's the thing, you see, that 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 to keep harassing them, you know, because of of some shibboleth, you know, something that they keep doing because because it's ingrained in them, just to keep harassing them. You know, and badgering them, you know, um, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. Understanding, sympathizing, empathizing with them is what helps. You know? And, but that's the reason why they themselves, they need to be at the means of grace constantly. The preaching, the exposition of God's word, the sacrament. So that, in time, by the means of grace, these traditions begin to fade and go away and the principles of God's word begin to take over. But it takes time. Sanctification is a progress. It's not instantaneous like justification. So Peter, but here's the thing, you see, that for Peter, Peter had already been dealt with. Remember the Cornelius um, situation? He's not, he's never touched anything unclean. He's never been near a Gentile in his life. He's not going there. And the Lord has to give him a vision in order to get him to go to Cornelius with the gospel. Maybe these are, maybe these men that he's sitting with Maybe they're believers, really truly believers, but who are still bound with these Judaistic traditions. Yeah. But, but whatever, they're creating dissension. It's a threat, you see. Uh, these, um, these traditions, you see, that the separation business, this was Pharisaic, Pharisaic tradition. This is what they were brought up with, you know. You don't sit down with Gentiles. You don't eat with them. Unclean, unclean, unclean. You've got to go away and wash yourself. But the problem is, the problem is, the point that Paul makes is, you see, that, that with this law business, yeah, with this Judaism business, it's the whole package. If you turn over to chapter 5, if you turn over to chapter 5 into verse 3, where Paul says, um, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Right? You do one part of it, the law, you've got to do the whole works. You get circumcised, you've got to do the separation business. You gotta do the whole works. Yeah. So um, um <laughs> you know, this is what the Judy, this is what the Judaizers wanted. So Peter, yeah, Barnabas, you know, and, and these Jews, whoever they are, you know, that they, they um they're playing right into the hands of the Judaizers. This is what they want. But Peter knew better. I mean, he ate, when he went to Cornelius, he took the gospel to Cornelius and his household. And, they, and, and Cornelius and his household were converted, were saved. The Holy Ghost fell upon them. And what happens next? Peter sitting down, eating with them. A Gentile. But he won't do that here. He himself argued. If you go back again to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 15. Um, I mean, this is Peter, Peter, go back to verse 7. 
And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up, Peter rose up, and said unto the men and brethren, Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe, and God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts and faith their hearts by faith. No difference between them and us. But not now of a sudden. Now he's gone backwards. Now he's backslidden. Now he's separating himself from the Gentiles in duplicity, dissimulation, hypocrisy. Oh, Peter, what are you doing, man? It's duplicity. It's, he can't claim ignorance. Do you know what I mean? So he joins them, he withdraws, he deliberately withdraws himself from the Gentile Christians in the Antioch church. He separates himself. Why? Verse 12 gives you the answer. Fear. It's that old sin in Peter. Fear that I don't think he ever got rid of. Sometimes we think a sin is dealt with, don't we? And we're cruising along, everything's fine, we think it's gone, it's dealt with, and wham, bam, there it is again, it rises up again. Peter denied the Lord three times, three times. Fear, fear, fear. Dissimulation, duplicity, fear. Fear of the Jews the Judaizers. Oh, Peter, fear. Eh? But the trouble is, you see, in doing so, we have every sympathy, every sympathy, because we suffer from fear ourselves. We all do. Brother said to me some, but some, some uh, time ago when I was, I was talking about some of my own fears. Oh, he says, I'm sorry, you've got that. He says, I don't have any fear. He said. Did I believe that? No. Do I believe that now? No, I don't. Only a lunatic never fears. No, we, we can sympathize, we can empathize with Peter with his fear, but what he is doing here, we cannot let this go because what he is doing, he's putting himself above the others, the Gentile Christians, and he's condemning the church for not doing what he is doing, segregating, separating themselves. So his conduct is cowardly, it's base, it's duplicious, it's hypocrisy. It contradicted the gospel that he preaches, that Paul preaches. The gospel that Paul defends and fights for in these very chapters, in this very book, in all his preaching and teaching ministry. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. It's the gospel that he's fighting for, not traditions. And that's what we as Christians need to be seen fighting for today as well. For the gospel singularly. Other matters on the periphery, some of them may be more important than others, but the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. Secondly, the, the diffusion, verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Not just Barnabas, but others too. He's drawing others with him. This is a problem in leadership, isn't it? If you're a leader, you lead. And how are you leading people? Are you leading them astray? Peter is here. The problem is infectious. Isn't sin always? Does Peter, is, is, is Peter truly a believer after all? Does he really truly believe what he preaches? Well, 
he wouldn't be he wouldn't be the last man to be found uh, <laughs> at the end not really truly believing what he's been preaching for many years. Come across one or two of them in my time. But that's not Peter, no, we, we, we do not believe that of Peter, no. He is an apostle, commissioned and sent, called by Jesus Christ. But this is a serious lapse, you know, due to that weakness, human weakness, sinful nature that remains, the remaining corruption, the flesh, the fear, the old fear. But his duplicity, you see, is, is hurting the gospel. That's the point here. It's inexcusable. We cannot justify it. We cannot justify anything, can we? But he's hurting others too. He's hurting the Antiochian church. He'll be hurting the whole, if this spreads, if this, this is allowed to go, he'll be hurting the whole church. It's like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, imagine me going into a church, you know, a church scene, Antioch, call it, we'll call it Antioch. I, I go into this church, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, we can bring it to the race issue, you know. Uh, there's, there's, a, a, there's a big bunch of, um, of, uh, uh, of Chinese people there, you know, but there's a small group of, of British guys. You know? And I say to myself, well, I'm not going to sit down, I'm not going to eat with these Chinese people, I'm, I'm going to sit with these British people. Or the, or the, 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 the race issue, the colour issue, you know, uh, or these black guys, no, I'm not sitting with them, I'm going to sit with the white guys. Or, or vice versa, if I was black, you know, I'm not sitting with these, these white guys, I'm going to sit with these black guys. So you see, it's, um, it, it really is a very, very important matter because you see, it, it's, it's, refu it's refuting the Catholicity, Catholicity of the church, the universality of the church. Because you see, there is neither Greek nor Jew, Jew nor Gentile, black or white, British or Chinese. We are all one in Christ. You see the serious, see the ramifications of this sin, why Paul deals with it so thoroughly, so emphatically. Uh, George Smeaton, in his excellent work on the work of the Holy Spirit, he says this, Thus the unity of the church is expressly named when it is said, there is one body, one spirit. Whether we regard it as living through a succession of economies or existing contemporaneously in the world in many lands, it is one, a society holding the head and knit together by the same spirit, though at some parts of its history, rather believed than capable of being distinctly traced. All true members of the church, because joined to the Lord, are one spirit, however differing in language, country or condition, while they who are without the spirit cannot be regarded as true members of the church because not animated by its vital principle. The church is one, not in consequence of its efforts after union, nor in virtue of the mutual harmony which pervades its different parts, for these are but fruits and pledges of a previous unity in the Lord, but in virtue of the one indwelling Spirit. One universal church, beloved. One universal church. Different languages, different cultures, different countries, Jews, Gentiles, Brits, Americans, Chinese, 
indwelt by the one Spirit, under one Lord, one body. If Peter is right in this, if these Jews are right, if these Judaizers are right, then Christ does not have one body. He has two bodies. An error that the dispensationalists have already fallen into. One body, one seed, one church, beginning to end from Adam all the way through to the end. a serious matter. It can't be left. It has to be dealt with. I mean, what was decided at the council in Jerusalem? Faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from the works of the law, justifies a man before God. I mean, even Peter got up and spoke in that council. And the Jew and Gentile, all one in Christ. So these brethren are not right. They're not walking rightly. Their conversation, you know, their conduct, their behavior. And for Paul to let this go would be like a dam bursting and it would it would be diffused amongst it would sweep others it already is it would sweep others along with them it would be diffused through the entire the whole church even 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 his trusted buddy Barnabas eh, is caught up with the dissimulation too it would have set the church back years so, you know, um, there would have been a permanent rift in the church. There would be this segrega segregation, Jew and Gentile, two churches, one Lord but two Lord's tables. They couldn't have the same table of the Lord. The Judaizers accused Paul of dissimulation. We think not. We think on the contrary that here the Apostle Paul shows great courage in dealing with this issue and dealing with it face to face with Peter and dealing with it publicly. But here's the point that he's making to the Galatian churches to whom he is writing. Yeah? On what authority does Paul do this? And what authority does Paul have to publicly, face to face, stand before Peter, point at him and say, you, brother, are a hypocrite. On the authority, on the authority that he is an apostle himself. That's the point. His credential get it? Proof that he is God's servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, commissioned, called, and sent by the risen, exalted Jesus Christ directly. Thirdly, the disapproval, verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Wow. The disapproval. A man's walk, but when I say that they walk not uprightly, a man's walk is his conduct, his conversation, his behavior, what he does, you know? And what do you believe? What a man believes, you see, orders his walk, his conduct, his conversation. If a man believes himself to be an atheist, then his life, his conduct will be godless, 
will be immortal. Yeah. Um, if you say that you, if you say that you are a Christian, that you believe the Bible, then that will affect, that will regulate your conduct, your behavior, your conversation. These men, Paul accuses them, Peter and the others too, he accuses them of not walking uprightly. They're not walking a straight line. Yeah? The line of God's gospel, of God's word. Yeah? They have gone astray, if you like. They have gone into bypath meadow. And of course, if you have left the straight line, if you've gone off, if you strayed, then you're heading in the wrong direction, okay? Their walk, their conduct, their behavior is contrary to their faith, to what they say that they actually believe. That's how people judge us, isn't it? By our walk, by our walk. Not so much our talk, but by our walk. And of course, well, if you're not a Christian and you be one of those who would maybe throw accusations against we who are Christians saying, did I tell you so? They're all hypocrites, you know, they're all inconsistent. There's none of them, um, none of them walk, you know, um, like they talk. Well, um, we would be, friend, we would be the first to, to acknowledge that. Well, well, I would at least anyway. You follow me around for, for long enough, you'll find some kind of inconsistency in me. There's none of us, none of us, totally and completely consistent in this world. We're reborn, we are forgiven, and we have the promise and the hope of eternal life. Um, and we... Look forward to that day when we will be totally consistent. So, uh, uh, judge us if you will, but we are forgiven. We are on the right track. And that's where you need to be. So, but we who are Christians, we do need to take heed to this. Because people do judge us by our walk by the way that we conduct ourselves, by the way that we behave ourselves. And so we need to take note of that. But of course, Peter's the prime target because he's an apostle, he's a leader, and that makes it worse because he's diffusing his conduct through the rest of the church, the congregation. He's leading others astray off the straight and narrow. Our lives, when will we learn that our lives speak louder than our words? But this is so serious, this is sin. And Paul calls Peter out, not because he's eating with the Jews. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with the man eating with Jews. That, that, that's not the sin. It's the circumstances, it's the motive, it's the fear, it's the traditions behind it. That's the problem. And Peter is well aware. He knows, he knows what he is doing. It's a gospel issue. Again, it's a gospel issue. The sufficiency of the cross. The sufficiency of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sufficiency of the grace of God. The sufficiency of faith alone apart from works. That's the issue. That's what's being endangered. And Antioch had been taught this by the Apostle Paul and by Barnabas. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, apart from the works of the law. And here's the Apostle Peter come all the way up from Jerusalem. What to do? To sow seeds of doubt in their minds. 
So the reproof, you see, the Apostle Paul's reproval, public reproval of Peter, is right and proper. It was the right thing to do. And it was done before, it was done publicly. It was done before everybody, as it should have been. You sin publicly, you confess, and you repent publicly. Because it's serious for everybody. What about weak believers in the congregation there at Antioch? Of course, you could say, well, you know, um, for Paul to do this, you know, that there's danger involved here. I, I mean, what if he loses his brother? Maybe Peter never talked to him again in his life. Maybe Barnabas would fall out with him and walk out the door and Paul be left on his own. And what about the other church members? Maybe they'll judge Paul for his actions. Maybe they'll say, well, he's harsh. He's self-righteous, you know. You know he's very judgmental. He's very unloving. <laughs> I guess that's what you would get in today's church. Well, you in this country at least anyway. Paul is not, he has already told us, huh? in, in chapter 1 and verse, t verse 10, let me read again. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Is this the actions? Is this the action of a man pleaser? Hmm? Of course it isn't. If Peter walks, Barnabas falls out with him, then so be it. There's something higher, there's something greater at stake. The glory of Christ and the glory of the gospel. It's the gospel that's at stake. So, so here's Peter, yeah, a pillar. <laughs> He's reproving a pillar of the church. Yeah. And how many others would he antagonize as well? Well, you see, the truth of the gospel is at stake. That's why. And here's the reason why there needs to be a plurality of elders in any church. Going back to my point yesterday, you know, about just having a minister and deacons. There has to be a plurality of elders for this very reason. Because the minister and the elders, they're men that there's equality there. There's not a hierarchy. The minister would be the one called to, um, to the ministry of the word. That doesn't mean to say the other elders don't preach sometimes, yeah. But he is primarily the minister of the word. But they're equals, yeah. They're ruling elders, you know. But these, these his fellow elder, the minister's fellow elders, are not there just simply to rubber stamp everything that the minister says and does. They're there, the other elders are there to listen carefully to what the minister is preaching and teaching, checking out his doctrine. And if he's wrong, if he, if he is wrong, they are to tell him that he is wrong. Reproof even if necessary. But if you do not have a plurality of elders, all you have is a situation where you've got a minister with deacons under him and he, he's a veritable pope. So um, that's the reason why there needs to be a plurality of elders. The reproof, uh, verse 14b, uh, he says to him, If thou being a Jew, livest after the man of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? It's a rhetorical question. He doesn't really seek an answer. Uh, but of course, even Peter, you know, even Peter here, you know, 
he's he's subject, you know, he's still, um, you know, the, still got this, um, this Judaism in him, you know, it, it dies hard, these traditions, you know, he's been taught of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, you know, he was given light at Pentecost, um, the Cornelius issue, and, and here it is, it rises again, yeah. Why, you might ask the question, why does the Lord permit, why does, the, why does he allow him to fall like this? Well, maybe, uh, you know, I can't prove this, but maybe one of the reasons is that, you know, um, to show him himself what he is, and that he himself might have more sympathy, because remember, he's a leader and he's a preacher in the church in Jer Jerusalem, where, which is the heartland of Judaism. So that's what he's dealing with all the time. And maybe the Lord permits him to fall in this way so that he will have more sympathy, empathy even, for those people with whom he's dealing with back down in Judea. Sometimes we get a lot. Sometimes we get a tad self-righteous, don't we, as Christians? Yeah, we are inconsistent. We get a tad self-righteous, you know, and very much so, especially so about sins that we are not involved in, or sins that we've been delivered from. You know, you get a guy who's been delivered from drunkenness, you know, and um, he's. Um, He's braying everybody uh, who even looks at you, even who sniffs a glass of alcohol, you know? Or he's been delivered, somebody's been delivered from some form of self-immorality and they've got all guns blazing against everything immoral, sexually immoral. And then sometimes maybe the Lord will allow them a lap into their former sin to teach them that they are still sinners just like the other sinners and they need to have a measure of sympathy empathy even I mean Jesus at the right hand of God there is there is nowhere in all God's universe where there is more sympathy for sinners than at the right hand of God But oughtn't we, oughtn't we to have? So that that's maybe who knows, who knows. But but the fear, the fear that makes us cowards of us all, doesn't it? Fear. It's a constant prayer of mine. I know about you. It's a constant prayer of mine that that the Lord would grant me a dying unto self and a dying unto the fear of man. Proverbs 29, verse 25, um, the fear of, fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso trusteth the Lord shall be safe. Oh, the fear, fear of man, makes cowards of us all. I guess that's why the Bible, over and over and over again, uh, fear thou not, fear not, only believe, yeah. over and over again. You say, you wonder, well, how did Peter take this? Well, we don't really know, but there is no evidence but that he took it humbly. And as, as a servant of God, as a Christian, ought to do, you know? Because, well, there were no further issues between him and Paul. And if you turn over to Second Peter... Uh, Second Peter and uh, chapter uh, chapter three and verse fifteen, where he speaks about Paul, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as listen, as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Our beloved brother Paul. He wrote that after this incident. Yeah. 
So the evidence would say that he didn't get the hump, he didn't walk out, uh, he didn't, um, you know, he didn't separate himself from, from his brother Paul. Um, but you see, why, you say, well, well why, why does Paul raise the issue here? Is he trying to shame Peter? Not, not at all. Not at all. He's showing the Galatians because his credentials are being questioned by the Judaizers. They're saying he's not an apostle at all. They're saying his gospel's not apostolic at all. And he's, he's, he's raising this issue. He's making this issue known to them to show them, to demonstrate that he's not inferior to the other apostles. He's an equal. He's on the same footing as Peter, James and John. He is an apostle too with them. And his gospel is the same gospel as theirs. And therefore it's to be believed in order for a man to be justified before God. He's doing it not to shame his brother. He's doing it for the gospel's sake. Which is far, far more important. So beloved in Christ, we must walk. We must walk the line the straight and narrow pathway. Ephesians, eh, Philippians rather, in Philippians chapter 3 and at verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. We need to walk uprightly all the time. We must believe and we must preserve and we must do our utmost to believe and to preserve and to preach the gospel, but we need to apply it to ourselves too, constantly. That word of the Lord Jesus, Mark chapter 1 and verse 15, repent ye and believe the gospel, is applicable not just to non-believers, it's applicable to us as Christians day by day and hour by hour too. That is our covenant walk. That is the line that we are to walk daily, hourly, momentarily. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Uh, Colossians. Turn over a page or two to the book of Colossians. Colossians in chapter 2, is it? Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You believe and you walk. You believe and you walk. You walk the line, the straight line, the narrow line, the narrow pathway, the one that leads to eternal glory, everlasting life. And yes, we must oppose, we must reprove the deniers. But over gospel issues, beloved, not shibboleths. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel is Paul's fighting for. I hear some brother in this country of mine, we're losing our country, you know, here in the United Kingdom. We're losing freedoms, you know. We're up against political correctness and all that stuff, you know. And, and um, our country... Well, I'm 76 years of age, you know, and I think of what my country was back, say, 60 years ago. Well, it's not just, it's not the Britain that um, it once was, you know. But some people have got this, you know, um, rule Britannia, Britannia never shall be slaves and all the rest of it, you know, and, and they want their Britain back. That's not the fight. That's not the fight. These political issues, I don't want to know anything about them. 
I know, I, you know, that's that politics. That, it, that you know, um, nationalism. I care nothing for it. I'm British by birth. Okay, that I am what I am. There's nothing I can do about that. But that's not my. That's not my daily fight. That's not what I'm battling for. That's not what I'm preaching for. To get Britain back in Britain. I'm, I'm fighting, I'm battling, I'm preaching to get the gospel into Britain. That now consists of many, many different cultures. And peoples and languages. But whoever they are, and whatever they are. Black or white, pink or yellow. Jew or Gentile, Muslim or Buddhist. I want to get the gospel into as many of them as I possibly can with the short time that's left to me. That's the fight, the gospel. But you see, I mean, this is, there are many who today deny the gospel Again, the Federal Visionists, N.T. Wright, the Roman Catholic Church, they deny the gospel. But the history of the church is the history of warfare, beloved. That's why we're called, what well, we used to be called, the church, um, um, what's the word, um, militant. The church militant. We've kind of lost that edge um, just now. We need to get it back. But we are supposed to be the church militant. You know, we're militant, we're fighting, warring against error in every day and generation. And our great confessions of the faith, which are so important, deal with these many, many issues that had to be warred, fought against by our forefathers. That's why these confessions are so important, because they deal with these many issues. We forsake, we neglect those great confessions of the faith, we lose our connection with the church in the past, and we are impoverished. Yes, they're subordinate standards, scripture is the bottom line, but they are not unimportant, not at all. But in order to defend the gospel, you need to know the gospel. You need to get yourself educated, get yourself to the means of grace. Grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be men and women of courage. Paul Schneider, the martyr, the man who was martyred in Nazi Germany in 1939, a man of awesome, great courage. The pastor of Buchenwald. He was martyred in Buchenwald concentration camp by his fellow countrymen, Nazis. He said, on one occasion, he said, um, it is only the man who is free from his self who has courage, the courage that is to stand, to fight for, and die for the gospel. A man himself who was faithful unto death. So um, there has to be, with Peter, there would have to have been repentance, public, public even. Um, the um, Westminster Confession of Faith, my favourite one, uh, chapter 15 and verse 5. Men ought not to content themselves with a general repentance, but it is every man's duty to endeavour to repent of his particular sins particularly. In Peter's case, his fear, his cowardice, his dissimulation, his duplicity, his offence against the church and the truth. Yeah? 
repent of his particular sins particularly. Section 6. As every man is bound to make private confession of his sins to God, praying for the pardon thereof, upon which, and the forsaking of them, he shall find mercy. So he that scandalizes his brother of the church of Christ ought to be willing by a private or public confession and sorrow for his sin to declare his repentance to those who are offended, who are thereupon to be reconciled to him and in love to receive him. Repentance particular and repentance public. And then, of course, well, they would follow on from that. The necessary, the necessary forgiveness. Something else that we need to learn to do as Christians is to forgive our brothers and sisters who confess and who repent of their sins. Luke chapter 17 and verse 3. Take heed to yourselves if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And that there is forgiveness with God that he may be feared is the very heart, the very essence of the gospel. That a man, a woman, whoever, whatever he be, whatever culture he's from, whatever colour of skin, whatever tradition he's been raised in, there is forgiveness with God that he may be feared. He can be justified, cleared in the court of heaven, forgiven how? Justified how? Freely by grace. Grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, 